uh, the Queen Victoria um, royal family and haemophilia for a good image of uh, sex linkage. So we can use that later. Let me just get up and shut my, my room door. Be back in a sec. Go. All right, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're going to be working on uh, basically non Mendelian inheritance for the next uh, couple of days, which is really about how things differ from what Mendel determined, right? Or at least what he wrote, because there's a good chance that he did see some of these things, but didn't know how to understand, like kind of explain them. They were kind of awkward. And so he just uh, shit canned them, basically. It's a bit of a mystery. We don't actually know. There's a lot of, uh, mm, a little contentious, let's put it that way. Anyway, so I'm going to sip my coffee first. We're going to start with sex determination and sex linkage, because they're pretty cool things to... Uh, to check out. Let's just find where are we at. There we go. Dum dum dum. All right. So uh, let's get chat back up. Make sure I don't miss that. All right. So again, if you've got any questions, uh, just shout them out or write them in the chat box and pardon me, I'll get to them. Right, so really there's, uh, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on this because there's more meat to the uh, next PowerPoint, PowerPoint 8, uh, which is like a whole bunch of stuff. It's a bit of a laundry list, to be honest. Uh, whereas this topic is relatively straightforward, right? Um, you know, obviously with its own details and stuff. So uh, this shouldn't take the full lecture, right? In, depending on questions and stuff, but ideally we'll be able to spend some of this kind of lecture period on the non, other non-Mendelian inheritance stuff. Right, so essentially there's two things going on here, and that's sex determination and sex linkage. Those two things are different. Sex determination is really what determines the biological sex of an organism, right? And that is, and also I want to be very clear that we're talking about biological sex. We're not talking about gender or sexuality or, um, you know, secondary sexual characteristics, stuff like that. We're just talking about fairly simple, basic biological sex uh, in terms of reproduction, really. Uh, and it's really curious because, you know, we're obviously, you know, our understanding of um, biological sex is changing over time. Um, but humans are actually a pretty boring topic to study in terms of um, biological sex, right? They don't really do an awful lot. You basically have two main uh, sexes, male and female, which are XX or XY, or the other way around, XY or XX. Uh, there's a lot of funky stuff out there. So um, then there's a lot of different ways in which it can be controlled. So uh, we're quite quite familiar with this idea. Come on, let's go over here. That uh, sex is determined chromosomally, right? We're we're familiar with the XXXY system. There are a lot of other ways of doing that. One of the uh, most common is environment, right? So it's actually, um, and the the common example here is uh, with reptiles. You know, so incubation temperature of eggs determines the the sex of that uh, individual in that egg, um, which is kind of crazy, really. I'm not entirely sure, like, the evolutionary benefit of that, but uh, it is fairly common amongst reptiles, even though they have different uh, kind of uh, ways of determining that in different temperatures. Another really funky one, too, is if you ever get to take uh, 
ichthyology, I think it is, fish biology, basically, with uh, Dr. Lutnetsky. You'll learn all about how several fish can change their sex during their own life in response to, you know, how many male or female fish are floating around beside them, right? And so they're able to use uh, kind of other cues. I'm not entirely sure how it works. I don't know if it's kind of a secreted hormone density or if it's kind of um, sex aggression behaviors or what. I don't actually know. You'd have to ask him. Um, but if there are an excess of males in a particular patch of water, then some of those males can change into females and, and produce eggs, which I think is totally bonkers, uh, if you ask me. Um, but really, really cool, obviously. And it makes sense if you think about it, because the ideal sex ratio is one to one, because that's uh, unless there are other um, mating mechanisms, right, which uh, influence that. Yeah, it's just like Jurassic Park, that's right. Um, and actually, it's really interesting, just kind of going off on a bit more of a tangent, um, based on a, on different reasons, both India and China have a skewed sex ratio. China, because of their one-child policy uh, favoring boys, and in India, it's based on uh, inheritance, right? So bo only boys inherit, and also girls cost a lot of money to kind of get shot of, basically, which is kind of, uh, anyway, let's not get into that. Um, so anyway, both both countries have a skewed sex ratio of, I think it's about 54% male to 46% female, something like that. It's that kind of range. Uh, which causes all kinds of weird, uh, you know, behaviors. It really does. Uh, like, for example, again, even more of a tangent, uh, in China, typically speaking, if if you're a male and you don't own a house or an apartment or property of some sort, um, you're not going to get a look-in with a lady, right? Because, uh, you know, there are, there's a scarcity of women of marriageable age and they can be more picky. So over time, you'd expect that to correct back to an equal ratio because of that, right? So anyway, it's interesting, right? It's kind of like that uh, junction of biology and uh, society, essentially. Anyway, uh, getting back on track, right, before I wander too far off into the, into the weeds, um, essentially, there are... Uh, in terms of chromosomal sex determination, there are a bunch of different ways of doing this. The XXXY is not the only one. So that's pretty common in mammals. Oh, you know something really cool? This will blow your mind. Uh, have you all heard of the of a platypus? They're super cute, very violent, really nasty little creatures. Um, in fact, the, the males have... Uh, venomous spines on their hind legs which if they stab you can actually kill you so not cute right remember dangerous anyway um they're called monotremes because they're mammals that lay eggs and they're really kind of weird uh but they actually have five pairs of x y chromosomes isn't that nuts and like each of the five x's just kind of like stick to each other to make like one monster x chromosome Never heard of that until I was scooching around on uh, Wikipedia this morning, looking up stuff. Anyway, I thought that was totally, totally crazy as well. Biology is really weird, I have to say, uh, which makes it so interesting. Anyway, so uh, there's also um, XXX null or X0, right? So my favorite organism, C. elegans. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of tied with sloths, basically. Um, has uh, essentially the males only have one X chromosome. That's it. They don't have a Y chromosome. So females are XX and males are X nothing, right? So they are uh, what's called hemizygous. Pardon me, let's write that up. It's a good word to use. So, for example, males, let's see if I can move this over just a wee touch. Oh, you 
G. Two. Spelling is not very good. Uh, so that actually underpins an awful lot of uh, sex, um, sex linked inheritance, right? Which we'll talk about later. So it's worth bearing bearing that in mind. So we've got other terms here which are heterogametic. So male mammals are heterogametic, right? We'll produce X or Y uh, gametes. Male birds, on the other hand, are not. They're homogametic because they are ZZ. Right, and so in birds, um, particularly chickens, uh, it's the other way around. Uh, females are the heterogametic sex, and they will be hemizygous for the Z chromosome. Okay, again, anytime you've got any questions, just stop and ask. Uh, that's kind of the deal. Otherwise, I'll just chunder on about all kinds of stuff. So that's not super interesting. Um, However, right, even within uh, a particular type of chromosomal sex determination, there are different mechanisms for uh, determining sex, right? So both mammals and Drosophila insects um, have an XXXY sex determination mechanism. But the, the actual molecular cause of that, or like what underlies that, is very, very different. And in fruit flies, it's more of a ratio deal. Oh, come on, get you down there. So in fruit flies, it's really how many autosomes to how many sex chromosomes. So let's see if I can write this out. It might be a little bit easier to, to get because this is a very good diagram, but it's not necessarily a very uh, accessible one. Okay. Let's see if I can do this without butchering the, the topic. Okay, so essentially, if you have... Oops, let's do it the other way around. All right, so... Even though flies actually have, what was it, four chromosomes, three autosomes and one sex chromosome, um, we actually, as a haploid uh, uh, gamete, we actually typically only refer to them as having two autosomes. Don't know why. It's because the fourth one is teeny tiny. It doesn't actually do very much. And so essentially what we have is something on those autosomes, right? which represses females. And so we also have something on here, on the X chromosome that promotes females. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. This is why I was checking up again this morning to make sure I knew what I was talking about. Not going to go into the precise molecular detail of this because I don't think it's necessary and it might just confuse you. But what I want you to get is that essentially there's going to be a balance. Let's use a different color. Between. Am I bright enough in here or do I need to put a light on? Can you see this clearly? I don't mind. Oh, hang on. I'm going to put a light on just so it's a little bit clearer kind of tricky to balance, you know, light and glare and stuff. Okay, hopefully that helps a little bit. Okay, yeah, so on the autosomes, right, you have a, uh, oh, 
Am I answering your question, Andrew, or is it a different question? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, that's what I'm just about to, to answer. I got distracted by putting a light on. So you have something on the autosome which uh, represses femaleness, essentially. Right. And you have something on the X chromosome over here. Let's use a different color. Which promotes femaleness. Right, so essentially what you have is a balance between the two. So when you have two autosomes and one X chromosome, so if there's uh, a little Y chromosome in here, which doesn't really do very much, the Y chromosome in flies is really, all it's involved in is producing sperm, right? It's, uh, well, not you know, itself, but the genes involved in sperm production. And so when you have uh, this ratio, right, so you've got two autosomes to one X chromosome, so that's uh, right, that ratio, or a ratio of 0.5, essentially, all right, if we're caring about the the order the sex chromosomes what this does is it overpowers or it represses the signal coming from the x chromosome because there's more signal coming from the autosomes than there is coming from the x chromosome because there's only one x chromosome right so essentially it's a balance between the two oh hang on we got a couple of Hands up. Gabrielle, did you have a question? A question. I just wanted to backtrack a little bit. You said for the ratio is 2A and then the 1X. I missed the 0.5. What is that? I missed the 0.5. Why is that 0.5? Oh, because 2 is 1 is half of 2. Okay. Yeah, because actually, it's to, I kind of wrote it the wrong way around. It's actually more commonly written. That way round. Okay. Yeah, I actually kind of realized that as I wrote it. It's like, damn it, did it the wrong way around. Yeah, so it's typically a 0. 0.5, a ratio of 0. 0.5. So uh, like half of an X to 1A, essentially, or 1X to 2A. Right, so if you have that set up, all of this equals male. So if you have only one X chromosome, the pro-female signal from the X chromosome is insufficient to kind of out overpower the pro-male signal, the anti-female signal from the autosomes. So as a consequence, you get males. Now, if you have... Let's go over on this side. Dum, dum, dum. This deal, yeah, there's a little bit echoey there. Let's kind of put it around that way. Now, we, go on. Okay, so you were saying that we will end up with males, but you're saying the X chromosome promotes females. Correct. But essentially, it's like a, if you think of it like a seesaw or a teeter totter. The pro, so eek. Sorry, this is kind of awkward. It feels like I've got a boombox on my shoulders. Um, over on this side, you've got uh, the basically the autosomes are pro male, right? Is one way of thinking about it. So if there's more A's, uh, the male possibility is pushed out. Male possibility is dominant, I think, is one way of thinking about it. Right, overpowers the female signal coming from the X chromosome or the sex chromosome. Does that help? Okay, yeah, thinking of it as dominant. Okay. Yeah, so um, it's not a perfect analogy because you, you'll see why in a second, but it's a good way of thinking about it. Right, so it's really a balance uh -oh. between the two. Right, so in, this, in the case of males with one X chromosome, the kind of pro male or anti-female 
is ascendant, right? It's overpowering the uh, pro-female signal coming from the X chromosome. Because it's a one to two. I got it. Correct. That's right. So when you look at uh, this genotype instead, or this uh, set of chromosomes, we still have the same deal, right? We still have uh, that equals males and, oops, this, sorry, bad left-hand uh, drawing, equals females. But now, essentially, there's two times as much pro-female, right? So this is able to kind of overpower or counteract the anti-female signal, right? And this is often expressed as a... Well, I'm not doing too bad for... Right with my left hand. Um, so now we have 2x to 2a. So now we have a ratio of 1 to 1, right? And so now there is sufficient pro-female uh, signal. Uh, yeah, that's totally right, Angela. Now you get female. So it's real, and you can actually have, you can have lots of weird ass things in flies, to be honest. So you can actually have uh, 3A, 3X individuals. Those would also be female. And you can have uh, 3A, 2X. Those would technically be male, even though they wouldn't be uh, fertile. Because it's all about the ratio between the X chromosomes and the autosomes, right? If it's 0.5, however many of the X and chromosomes and autosomes there are, you'll be male. If it's one to one, or a ratio of one, again, you could be 4X4A, which I guess is possible, you'd still be female, right? So it's all about the ratio between the two. It has nothing to do with that little thing here. The, the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome is irrelevant in sex determination in males. Obviously, if you don't have a Y chromosome, you don't produce sperm, which is a bad thing. But uh, in terms of sex determination, the Y chromosome doesn't play a single bit in this. It's just the ratio of A to X. Ta-da! Did that help? Any questions? Give you time to cogitate on that. Good. Okay, so let's get the um, PowerPoint back up again. Now for uh, mammals, it's very different. And so this is a neat, basically a diagram showing the same kind of thing, right? So the uh, just to add a little, little bit to that, what we talked about, the outcome of that ratio is whether or not uh, this gene, which is uh, SXL stands for sex lethal, is turned on or not. And so if you have two X chromosomes, you have enough of that pro-female signal to turn sex lethal on. So you inhibit maleness and you promote femaleness, essentially. And when there is insufficient signal from the X chromosome to overpower that uh, autosome signal, sex lethal is turned off, and so then you essentially become male. Right. So that's just a little bit more. Yes, that's exactly. So flies are weird. Don't get me started on on fly gene names and stuff. Drives me absolutely batty. Uh, but. Yes, uh, sex lethal, SXL stands for sex lethal. Actually, believe it or not, one of the genes involved in this is called deadpan. Rest my case. And then there's sonic hedgehog. There's another gene called shaven baby. You know, I could go on a, like a proper rant about uh, 
Drosophila researchers and their gene naming conventions. In C. elegans, it's very, very rigid, right? We have rules. We give things normal names and stuff. I've had this argument so many times at conferences with fly people. They just call us boring. I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. Um, anyway, so uh, trying to get back off of that tangent. It's like fly people. Yeah, totally. I'm a worm person because I work on worms. They're far superior. They don't fly around and annoy you, which is a big thing. And try and eat your lunch. Um, anyway, so in uh, in humans, yeah, actually, some oh, I've got a work. That's a shame. I've actually got a uh, um, plush plushy worm, uh, C. elegans worm, because that's what I work on. And there's even every two years. When was it last time? Yeah, last summer. Uh, there's the International Worm Conference. And there are literally thousands of people that come to that. It's in uh, UCLA in uh, Los Angeles. Yeah, so we take over the, most of the university with just hordes of fly people. Uh, not fly people, worm people uh, wandering around talking about worms. It's very exciting. It's like kind of like Comic-Con or NerdCon, but for C. elegans researchers. Anyway, so, uh, yeah. um, in humans, it's very different, right? So in humans, the Y chromosome is important. It's actually very important. And so um, the difference here, so in flies, essentially flies are male or female right from the get-go, right? As soon as um, the oocyte is fertilized, right? As soon as you have a zygote. In humans... I can't actually remember exactly when in embryonic development uh, the switchover happens, I think. Yeah, it must be around a couple of months, something like that. Uh, essentially, we start off as having both potential to be either sex, right, in biological terms. right? We have undifferentiated gonads, we have both male and female reproductive ducts. And then essentially what happens is that there's a region on the Y chromosome which starts biasing that towards maleness if you are XY. And this region is called the sex determinant region or SRI or S R O Y. And essentially, the main, I mean, there's lots of things involved in that, also sperm, develop, uh, sperm production too. But one of the main things is um, the promotion of testes development, right? So those gonads which are undifferentiated start differentiating into testes and testes produce uh, a lot of testosterone now females also produce testosterone too but the levels are much much lower pardon me and so that testosterone is often called a sex hormone um, which is a bit of a misnomer it's actually involved in an awful lot of things uh, including bone development for one uh, and muscle development and things like that so it's not solely involved in uh, determining biological sex, right? But because that's like its most well-known one, it gets called a sex hormone. Um, and so anyway, the testosterone basically starts uh, biasing um, sexual development towards maleness. And the other thing that happens is that the testes, which are developing as a result of the SRY uh, region, um, also inhibit, uh, produce something called the malarian inhibiting substance. And the malarian ducts are basically the um, progenitors of the female reproductive system, right? The ovarian ducts and uh, the ovaries and, and things like that, the uterus. And so what the malarian inhibiting substance does is cause that those ducts to kind of just disappear, right? They just get reabsorbed. And so you're left with just the testes and the epididymis and whatever else uh, is necessary for male development. Okay. I was just telling me I got a lecture. <laughs> um, so any questions about male sex, uh, mammalian, sorry, or human uh, sex determination? Why on that? You're probably still reeling from the whole... Uh, worm conference revelation but 
Hopefully I didn't distract you too much. It's a lot of fun. It's uh, pretty intense. It's like three days. How long is it? No, actually it's longer than that. It's typically like four, four days or so, usually four and a half with travel, um, of just full on, you know, uh, the first session, session starts at like 8.30 or 8.45 in the morning and the, it goes until about 7 or 8 o'clock at night. And so it is just, it's exhausting. Um, yeah, it's it's really, really cool. I look forward to it every... Oh, and also, haha, there's, uh, this will also crack you up, there's the Worm Art Show too. And so any kind of uh, worm-related art can be entered. Yeah, it's really neat. Actually, what is set up by one of the older professors who she her parents were artists and so she really wanted to express the artistic side of herself and so she set up this art show and i actually won a prize once if you go to my youtube channel right at the very bottom uh there's a there's a video uh which i made of uh pictures of my worm over over the course of a couple of years and I made some worm jewelry uh, last time out of stainless steel, like some earrings and some necklaces and stuff. So I didn't win that one, which is kind of sad. Uh, but anyway, there you go. Someone once made a worm costume, like a full-size worm costume with eggs and a vulva and everything, uh, which was really cool. Anyway, so sex linkage is different and sex linkage uh, or sex linked inheritance is um, is very different right and so essentially sex linked inheritance is based on um, the hemizygous nature of one sex right and so you're very familiar with this idea that um, you know, we're, we're diploid, right? So we have two sets of chromosomes um, and you have to have two recessive alleles to express a recessive phenotype. However, for sex chromosomes, if you're hemizygous, right, you only have one sex chromosome, uh, as a case of males, for example, there's no second chromosome or second copy of that gene to potentially... Uh, dominate or suppress the expression of that recessive allele. So uh, typically, m at least in, in uh, humans, um, the sex-linked traits are expressed in males. And so in, uh, in females, you, you can be homozygous recessive, right, and express the trait, but that's fairly rare. You're quite commonly heterozygous and so you carry that uh, recessive allele but you don't express the phenotype and um, your male offspring have the potential to uh, express that phenotype if they inherit that recessive allele so I'm just quickly going to give you a um, kind of look at how this was first uh, determined and a little bit of terminology essentially and then I'm going to get out of this and show you a cool image of the Queen Victoria's uh, uh, family tree right which is a great example obviously actually there's not too much inbreeding in that uh, not like King Philip of Spain anyway so uh, essentially the um, and they're not that scary you should try seeing like uh, mites, M-I-T-E-S, underneath a microscope. Those are terrifying. Um, so sex linkage was really determined in, uh, oh, the inbreeding. <laughs> well, I mean, it's royalty. It's like, actually, you know, I read a funny comment once, which was, you know, considering how uh, good royal families are breeding horses, you know, it's kind of like a thing. Uh, they really, really suck at breeding themselves. You know, uh, if you just, I mean, look at King Charles. Ew. Anyway. Um, yeah, so also look up uh, King 
Republic of Spain. Uh, let's see, is our actual house? Come on, gone on a bit of a tangent. I think it's the Habsburg. Do do do. Yeah, getting a little bit distracted here. All right, I'll have to go dig into that. Uh, it's like the movie Wrong Turn. I don't think I've seen that one. But I'll, uh, I'll check it out. Anyway, sorry, getting distracted again. Um, so anyway, uh, the big thing with sex linkage is you'll get a different expression of the phenotype depending on what sex you are, right? So uh, if you're male, you're more likely, and it's a XY, XX system, you're more likely to express a phenotype than if you're female. So one thing to look at in a lineage is do you see more disease typically? in males in that lineage than you do in females, right? And if that's the case, then uh, there's a good chance that it's uh, sex linked. The other uh, classic uh, way of determining this is if you do the reciprocal cross, you'll get a different result. And so uh, you'll have to kind of like squint in and look at this closely a little bit when you have time. But if you do uh, like a female dominant to male recessive you'll get a certain outcome a three to one outcome in the f2 generation but if you do white eyed female to or recessive female to dominant male you'll get a one to one ratio in the f2 generation and so that's a classic indicator of sex linked inheritance is if you do the cross one way you get a certain result in the f2 but you do the other way and you get a different result then something is biasing uh, that, and that is typically sex linkage. Okay, so let's get out of this, and I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to traumatize you a little bit with my uh, 101 tabs. Come on. 101. me. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. Here we go. Okay, let's see if I can get that a little bit bigger. Can you see that okay? Now, where's the chat gone? Bloody hell. Awesome. Cool. Okay, so essentially what we have here is, let's move that over there so you can see everything is Queen Victoria was a carrier for haemophilia. And so haemophilia is a nasty disease. And it basically is um, due to lack of blood clotting. So typically, whenever you uh, cut yourself, uh, there's a whole bunch of um, proteins called thrombin and fibrin and stuff like that, which kind of clot together to form this mesh to block the wound. And then that mesh fills up with, you know, red blood cells and other proteins, and then it seals the wound, right? So you don't bleed out. With hemophilia, if you get a small cut, it never clots, right? And so, because I think it's, yeah, I think it's uh, problems with thrombin. I'm not 100% sure, but I can, I can check on that. Um, but essentially, if you, uh, if you get cut, then uh, you just never stop bleeding, right? And you can actually bleed out and die from a um, very small cut or wound. Same with bruising as well. You know, bruising, typically you have like a hematoma, you know, a kind of a burst capillaries underneath your skin. Um, if you're hemophiliac, then that never stops, right? You, so you can essentially fall over, bang your leg and bleed to death internally from uh, that bruise. And so uh, Queen Victoria was a carrier for haemophilia, um, married to Prince Albert. So actually in the U UK, in London, there's a, 
the Prince Albert and Queen Victoria Museum, which is super cool. Uh, if you're ever there, you should go to it. Anyway, so she was a carrier. So she ha was heterozygous for this uh, hemophilia causing allele. And you can see in her offspring, she had, uh, I don't know who that was, but she had a bunch of kids, uh, as a good queen should do. Um, and of them, there were some females that were Beatrice and Alice who were also carriers. So they inherited her X chromosome with this uh, recessive allele. Now, they have essentially a 50-50 chance of getting that X chromosome. And the same with males, actually, right? So each male will receive their Y chromosome from their father, which is Albert and have a 50-50 chance of getting an X chromosome with a recessive allele from um, their mother. And so you can see here, we've got one, two, three, four um, male offspring. Is that right? Yeah, four male offspring. And of those, um, one of them inherited uh, a recessive or mutant X chromosome. And so Leopold had hemophilia. Right now, he was uh, lucky enough, I guess, to uh, be able to live long enough to reproduce. That's not always the case. Um, quite often, you'll see um, in the case, let's look over here. So, quick terminology deal open circle is unaffected, half colored circle is a carrier, fully colored circle is uh, expressing the phenotype, a disease in this case. And circles are female and squares are, are male. So if you look throughout these lineages, right? So over here on the on the left, oh yeah, look at that inbreeding, great. Um, if you look over here on the left, uh, you can see Edward the Seventh's lineage was free of hemophilia because he didn't get it from his mother. Um, and of these, you know, a bunch of the males obviously lived long enough to marry and reproduce. If you look at these other lineages which have hemophilia in them, it's very rare that you'll have a hemophiliac male that will uh, reproduce and sire offspring, right? The only exception is Leopold, right? He may maybe had a less severe form, but the other Leopold over here, Maurice Gonzalo, uh, Spanish, I guess, Alfonso, whoever this is, uh, and these two all died young of hemophilia. The only exception is Alexis of uh, the Tsar Nicholas's uh, royal family. This must be Nicholas here, I guess. Um, he didn't die of hemophilia. He died of uh, being uh, executed by the, um, the Bolsheviks during the Russian Revolution. Basically, he and his family and his uh, his sisters and so on were all killed somewhere in Siberia. Yeah, it was pretty brutal. Um, that was in 1917 or so. There's still these conspiracy theories that one of these uh, sisters like grew up and stuff, but they actually found the the grave in a forest in Siberia uh, a few years ago and managed to kind of genotype them using um, samples from other existing royal family members and and determined that they were actually the Russian royal family. Anyway, so anytime you see this kind of pattern, right, where you have female carriers, but no female affected individuals, which uh, there aren't any here, right, and only male affected individuals, that is sex linked inheritance, right? So there is a very strong difference in expression of the phenotype between male and female sexes, which if this was not on the sex chromosome or the X chromosome, you would not see, right? And so that's a really important uh, point to make is that you, if you're on an autosome, you'll get a, you should get a one-to-one -one ratio or no difference between the sexes in terms of the expression of the phenotype. If it's sex linked, you will, and you'll typically uh, almost all of them are recessive uh, uh, traits or recessive uh, diseases, rather. Uh, you will see them typically only in the males. And that's because males are hemizygous. They only have one copy of this gene. Uh, 
So if that gene is duff, doesn't work, you're kind of screwed. You've got the disease. Right. Does anybody have any questions about that? Other than the uh, Russian Revolution in 1917. I'm not sure I could answer all your questions on that. It's actually very clever by the, the Germans kind of uh, facilitated that um, because they wanted to get the Russians out of the First World War. So it was partly down to the Germans, which is, uh, or Austria-Hungarian Austria German kind of empire. Okay, cool beans. Right, so I use this example because this is a really quite an easy one to get. And there's so many data points that the pattern is really obvious. There are other examples of it, but I like this one uh, most of all. All right, so, oh, here we go. Let's get off of that. You don't want to see all my tabs no more. And let's get back to, here we go. Dum, dum, dum. Okay, so we're going to skip over the, the barred chicken example because uh, it's not a bad one, but it's not as uh, accessible, I would say, as as the other. Okie doke. So, uh, a little bit more information on the Y chromosome, um, and particularly about uh, recombination and, and its size, right? So, the Y chromosome, if you actually look at a carrier type, like a picture of the uh, all the different chromosomes in humans, the Y chromosome is like, it's tiny. It's really, really small. Uh, both compared to the other autosomes and to the X chromosome. And uh, essentially, it doesn't have many genes on it, right? So it's very small and it doesn't undergo an awful lot of recombination. And so this is really interesting because it's very hard to track human evolution um, because essentially there's lots of mixing, there's lots of noise going on. And so there are two ways in which you can easily track human evolution and migration, right? So the out of Africa hypothesis, the movement from uh, East Asia through um, um, the Arabic world to Eastern Europe, for example, is another one. Um, you can either do it by mitochondrial DNA, uh, which is inherited uh, purely by uh, from the female side essentially. So all of my mitochondrial DNA comes from my mother and my grandmother and her mother and, you know, so on forevermore, right? Or you could use the Y chromosome. And the reason being is that the Y chromosome doesn't undergo much recombination because it's so very small. And so essentially there are, and we'll get to this in when we look at linkage on Thursday, um, Essentially, there are whole chunks of the Y chromosome that never get reshuffled, right? That always happens typically with the, the autosomes and the X chromosome because they're much larger. Um, but in the Y chromosome, that reshuffling doesn't really happen much. And so essentially, the Y chromosome that I have in all my cells is going to look very similar to the Y chromosome my dad had and his dad and his dad and so on. And so really the main difference in uh, your Y chromosome, if you're male, comes from mutation. And mutation occurs at a slower rate than recombination does, right? You know, it's because it's random chance and occurs, you know, as a result of DNA replication. And so what we can do, actually, let's just talk about haplotypes um, for a second. So... Um, haplotype is like a set of uh, alleles, right, within a uh, kind of like a linkage group. So that's like a like a barcode or a fingerprint or a stamp, right? That's kind of a a particular uh, marker, essentially, of an individual or a particular type of individual, or, you know, race or origin. And so if we look at uh, Genghis Khan, right? So he was a very famous uh, 
emperor, right, who came out of Mongolia. And basically, the um, the Mongol Empire stretched all the way to the stands, right, Turkmenistan and the like in the Middle East, over here, the borders of the Caspian Sea, all the way to the far east of Russia and China. He didn't get too far south. I don't know why. Um, but anyway, really, really interesting part of history. First checkbook actually came from uh, the Mongol Empire because it was really hard to get money from all the way over here to all the way over there, basically. So they started writing down on paper. So it became checks. Anyway, so if you look at uh, the Y haplotype of Genghis Khan, or what we presume is from Genghis Khan, you can actually see how that spreads out uh, over, you know, essentially centuries of uh, of reproduction and migration, so that the highest uh, percentage of that haplotype or that particular origin is uh, kind of northeastern China and Mongolia. And then you can see how it kind of diverges from there and it really maps out to that empire as it was. So it's really interesting to kind of see how uh, kind of genetics and history overlay each other, right? How those two things interact. And you can do the same thing for, um, you know, obviously the out of Africa hypothesis, you can do similar things for um, the evolution of lactose tolerance in um, kind of over on the further to the west on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean, even redheadedness from uh, Western Russia, right? You can follow these things and you can actually use these markers to track uh, migration, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, that's pretty much it for this uh, PowerPoint. Does anybody have any questions before we move on? Yeah. If not, speak now or forever hold your peace, as they say. Okay, so. All right, let's go on to okay so we're going to do i don't know like 10 15 minutes of this um just so we can get through this all today because there's a lot of stuff going on in here it's a little crazy 29 slides so um i want to make a start on this before uh we take a short break just so that uh, we can get you know some some of it put away beforehand so one thing I really want to get across from talking about Mendelian inheritance is that what Mendel laid out is very much a kind of scaffold or framework to think about inheritance of traits. It's not the whole picture, but it's a very useful kind of like pattern to kind of stick up on the wall and say, okay, does what is what I'm studying match that right and if it doesn't that gives us some leads as to what might be going on so we can kind of figure out uh whatever the basis of whatever we're studying right and so you know if you're doing a, a genetic cross and you know you expect a certain ratio in the offspring and you don't get it essentially that tells you that hang on whatever you're working on is not following Mendelian inheritance patterns. And so something else is happening. And so that's really the power of uh, studying Mendelian inheritance. Really, it's not for its own sake, right? Because in and of itself, it's, you know, it doesn't really reflect a lot of reality, but it is an extremely useful framework to use to compare what you're studying with with what you would expect if it followed those particular rules, right? And so essentially there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on, right? And it could be for a lot of different reasons, right? So obviously there's, uh, pun me, polygenic, uh, uh, genetic, sorry, uh, reasons of which there are many. And they're environmental reasons. And so the environmental reasons are really the uh, 
could be a bit of nature versus nurture, right? And the interaction between the two, so which is called a genotype by environment and interaction. It could be that genes have very little to do with what phenotype you have. It's really a um, it's an environmental uh, determination. And you know, sex in fish would be one of those, for example. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, kind of all of these and go through them kind of one by one, essentially. Right. And so uh, the genetic reasons, there are many of them. Right. So uh, one, simple dominance is not a play. Two, there's more than one gene that controls a trait, which, to be honest, is almost always the case, unless we're talking about inherited human disease. Right. So high eye color. Eye color is controlled by I think it's at least five different genes, right? So the whole brown is dominant, blue is recessive thing is, yeah, it's like a gross oversimplification, really. Um, there's a sex-dependent expression of a, of a genotype. There's a linkage as well, right, which we're going to devote pretty much all of Thursday to because it's, uh, it's pretty chunky. And so we're going to go through all of those because... That's really how you get more or less the whole picture of inheritance, right? It's to start putting these different bits of non-Mendelian inheritance onto that framework to see kind of where they fit. Okay, so uh, you already understand what dominance is really, right? So essentially that dominance is based on function. And so typically... Uh, a dominant allele is one that works. Well, it's not always, um, at least in that sense. It's what works normally. So if you have a, a mutation which stops that protein from working or being produced or changes its function, most likely that's going to be a recessive allele, right? Because it doesn't work as well. You can also have what's called gain of function mutations those make something work even when it shouldn't right so typically a protein getting expressed where or when it shouldn't be expressed or functioning where it shouldn't be functioning um, typically those are dominant right or semi-dominant right so dominance is is a lot more complex than first appears essentially and so really in terms of uh, Mendelian or non-Mendelian inheritance, there's two kinds of dominance that we're going to talk about. There are others. We're not going to go into them right now. Um, or actually, maybe even in this course, it depends. It's kind of, there are many, many, many more levels. It's like we're kind of, we're on the second or third floor of genetics and there's like a whole skyscraper above us. Um, and so there's two things that we're going to be covering. One is incomplete dominance. The other one is co-dominance. Oh, actually, that's a point. I need to find another good picture. Um, incomplete dominance is essentially uh, kind of comes back to this. Uh, there's another term. All right, and I'm going to write this in the chat box just so it's up there. It's called haplosufficient, right? We haven't come across this yet, but it's a useful term to use. And that basically means one uh, copy of a functioning for the normal, yeah. Right, so that's a useful term because that's the underpinning of the normal form of dominance, right? So essentially, as long as you have one functioning allele which produces the normal functioning protein everything works normally because you don't see the non-functioning one because it's it's never an issue now you can also have something called haplo insufficient and that's basically one copy Ah, uh, typing sucks. 
And so that's kind of a, a not quite enough deal, right? So essentially what happens here is that you have, for a heterozygous individual, you have one allele that's working normally and producing a functioning protein and one which isn't, but you really need both of those alleles functioning, both copies of those genes to be producing functioning protein to see the normal phenotype. And so when you have a heterozygous in individual, now you're going to see something less than a normal phenotype, but more than the mutant phenotype. You're going to see something in between. And so the term for that if we're looking at inheritance, is incomplete dominance. And the, I actually learned a new example, which is kind of cool, um, are aubergines. But the classic example is snapdragons. And so pigmentation is a very common example. Well, I wouldn't say common, uh, because there aren't many examples of it, but is a relatively straightforward way of thinking about incomplete dominance. And so if you, I, don't know, I think, I'm trying to explain this well, essentially you think about uh, uh, an underlying color of something or lack of color, right? So white plants, for example, produce no pigment. And as any of you know, if you try and paint over uh, like a strong color, it takes a lot of coats of paint to get a complete uniform color. Right? If you just do like one coat of uh, paint over another color, it kind of looks like something in between. That's essentially what's going on here with pigment. So with white plant, you don't have any pigment, so there's no color, right? Or you see whatever the underlying color is, like you're doing corn. Pardon me. And if you have two copies of that pigment producing gene that are working, then you produce a lot of pigment and then you basically cover that white color with pigment. And so you see the color of the pigment. Now, in the uh, case of snapdragons, which are, this uh, allele is haploinsufficient, if you only have one copy, functioning copy of that allele, you have some pigment. And so you kind of do like the first coat over that white background but you don't have enough pigment to do like a block color. So you get an intermediate phenotype. And the classic uh, uh, characteristic of incomplete dominance is what we see at the bottom of this slide. And so instead of getting a three to one phenotype ratio or one to two to one genotype and a three to one phenotype ratio, now you get a one to two to one genotype and phenotype ratio. So you get, well, actually there's two characteristics. One is you get three phenotypes in the F2 generation. And two, you get a one to two to one phenotype ratio. So you'll see the one being homozygous, so it'll either be red or white, and the two being heterozygous, which will be an intermediate phenotype. And you can also see that with uh, uh, aubergine or eggplants, I think they're called in the US, um, where you can see an intermediate uh, phenotype in the heterozygotes. And again, you'll see that one to two to one ratio in um, the F2 generation. Right, I'm going to give you a, a Oh, we've got a little bit more on, on this. Let's do a little bit more and then I'll, I'll maybe we'll take a break or maybe we'll look at codominance. Because uh, the example of codominance here isn't the most accessible. So I'd like to give you another one to kind of hammer the point home. So another wrinkle in this is that it depends on what level you look at the phenotype or look at the trait. right? Because there's uh, what you could call the gross phenotype, right? which is essentially... What can you see with your eyes, right? You know, is that person short or tall? Uh, those peas are wrinkled or round or whatever, right? And so um, if you're excessive at the kind of like the whole organism level, um, the pattern of dominance is going to be very different to when you observe it at a much more fine-grained level, particularly a molecular level, right? 
And so the classic example of that is uh, wrinkled peas, right? So um, if you look down at the bottom, uh, this, this is what you'd see from a uh, classic monohybrid cross, right? So if you cross round with wrinkled peas, round peas are the dominant, uh, wrinkled are the res uh, homozygous recessive. If you cross heterozygotes together, you'll get a three to one ratio of round to wrinkled peas, right? Even though it's a one to two to one ratio in terms of genotype. However, when you look at this at a microscopic level, you actually see three different phenotypes, right? You see, uh, well, actually, an even more complicated phenotype. You see, in the wrinkled, it's easy. Like they have small, uh, irregular grains, which basically means that when the peas dry, they don't shrink uniformly. They kind of shrink in like a more random pattern, right? When you look at the heterozygotes, they have larger grains, but they're still irregular, right? But those large grains are sufficient to when they dry down, they dry round. And in the homozygous dominant, you'll see uh, large round grains, right? Which essentially produces the same phenotype as a large irregular grains. And this is all based on an enzyme called starch branching enzyme one, I think from memory, uh, which produces this... Uh, was our myelopectin, I think? Yeah. Um, produces a long kind of starchy molecule which forms these grains, right? And so if you have a, two copies of a non functioning version of this gene, you don't get much of myelopectin produced and the grains are very irregular, right? However, if you're a heterozygote, you're still producing half the level of this enzyme. Right, so if you look at the actual amount of the protein, like functional protein present, right, so this is a molecular level, you actually see that the heterozygote is an intermediate phenotype, right, it has approximately half the functioning uh, enzyme as a homozygous dominant, which is what you'd expect because it still has one functioning copy. And that's enough to make these large grains, which is enough to get this round phenotype right when those peas dry now obviously when you look at the homozygous dominant now you have two functioning copies you have twice as much uh, enzyme as the heterozygote and now you have those large round grains so it very much depends on kind of what scale you look at whether that pattern of dominance is as simple as you think Kind of the more fine grained you get, the the less well those simple patterns fit, essentially. Okay, and I think that's a pretty good time to stop because uh, we want to talk about co-dominance next. I need to find a good uh, picture. So how about we come back in uh, 10 minutes, uh, meet back at 12, four, uh, 1220. Um, oops. And, uh, you know, take a break, brush your teeth, get a coffee, that kind of stuff. Um, and then we'll continue with co-dominance and uh, the rest of this jazz uh, after that. All right. Cool. I'm going to leave this running. Unfortunately, my cat is not here to entertain you with her, you know, lying around doing nothing. She's off somewhere else. Don't know where. Uh, so I'll leave you a nice whiteboard to stare at if you've got nothing else to do. All right, see you in 10 minutes.
Let's move a kitty cam. What do you want, cat? Hmm? She wants to coat the entire place in fur. Because that's what you do, cat. All right. Well, give me a few moments to uh, dig up a nice uh, picture. And then we'll be getting back to our business. Mm -mm. Okay. Yes, cat. Yes, yes, fine. She's very demanding. Isn't she? You see? There you go. Lots of love. I don't know. It was one of my kids. There you go. Get off. <sighs> um, one of my kids chose it. Noel. The other one's called Jasmine. Uh, okay. Getting distracted. Um... Oh, that's a nice picture. All right. That's Okay, so the uh, next thing that I want to talk about is uh, codominance. Oh, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, and so uh, codominance, let's stop sharing this. And, and hopefully this is a system you've already come across. Because uh, it's really one of the best ways of uh, thinking about codominance that you can get. And that's blood type, right? So this is from Wikipedia because it's a really nice uh, graphic. And so essentially you have uh, three different alleles for red blood type, right? You have uh, an A, B, and a O allele, right? And the... O is the classic recessive allele, right? But the A and B alleles actually encode different antigens, right? So um, down here, you can see those A and B antigens, right? So if you're homozygous recessive for the O allele, then you will not produce any of those antigens, right? And you'll be blood group O. If you are heterozygous for A and O, for example, A will be dominant over O, and the same for for B and O. You know, B will be dominant over O, right? So those heterozygotes follow the classic cat. Quit it. Uh, follow the cat classic pattern of dominance, right? That we've uh, we've kind of studied so far. Now, the, the funky thing is, if you are heterozygous for the A and B alleles, so now, because those alleles produce different antigens, essentially different proteins that produce a different immune response, then uh, now you can see up here, you will be both A and B, right? And so the classic uh, form of dominance no longer plays a part. This isn't into, this isn't, uh, hang on. Just get this out of the way. 
Um, this is an incomplete dominance, right? It's not where you have uh, uh, an incomplete masking of the recessive allele because the recessive allele is no antigen, right? This is where uh, you can express both alleles which are different at the same time, right? So this is, and they are dominant alleles. So B is dominant over O, A is dominant over O, but A and B are not dominant over each other. They can both be expressed at the same time. And that produces like some real funky stuff where uh, if you're, I'm group B, right? So uh, essentially I can give blood to other people with um, B or I can give it to um uh group a b and yeah that's it so i can give blood to uh people who are b or a b blood types right because they don't uh do not produce an antigen against the b uh, an antibody sorry against the b antigen right which you can see down here in this middle uh row so uh Group O individuals are the universal donors, right? Because they don't produce, they don't have any antigens and so they don't react. So you can stick uh, group O blood into anybody and you're not going to get a reaction, a glutination. Um, AB individuals can accept blood from anybody because they don't produce any antibodies against any of them. The other ones are more specific typically to their type um, or to the um, the AB, which doesn't produce uh, antibodies. Uh, so essentially, you produce the antibody to the antigen you don't have. Not entirely sure why that is the case. Who knows? Um, but this is a really great example of codominance. There aren't really very many of them, to be honest, in terms of examples. This is the best one that I've I've found so far. And really, the thing to remember is if you have um I don't know whether I don't know the relative uh ratios of um the different blood types. Uh what is it proportion? Let's do it in the US just to narrow it down. Yeah, it is common, which is good for us, right? Because it's the it's the universal donor. Um, however, that ratio, that percent does vary depending on uh, background, like where your ancestors came from, basically. And so if we were to look at Europe or Africa or Asia or uh, Latin America, the, that percent may differ depending on the different uh, mix of those. All right. Anybody got any questions about uh, codominance? So typically you'll see if you can express two alleles, two different alleles at the same time. So one allele is not dominant over the other. Obviously in the blood groups, we've got both classic dominance and codominance, right? Classic dominance between any of the A and B alleles and O and then codominance between the A and B alleles, right? So it kind of adds like another wrinkle essentially on top of that. Okay. Uh, o is always recessive. That's right. So it's it's uh, homozygous recessive. Well, so group O, the phenotype, is homozygous recessive. The O allele is also recessive. Oh, hang on. Yeah. So that hopefully like lays it out a little bit more clearly. <laughs> 
So, Gabrielle, was that did, was that you asking that question? No, you got your hand up. What's your question, Gabrielle? Oh, hand has disappeared. Um, I didn't realize it was up. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Go on. Oh, all right. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. So, it's, blood type is really interesting. It's a real cool example to to talk about because it mixes both of those different things. Okay, let's get back to. Um, Come on. There we go. Let's get back to the PowerPoint. All right. So, um, and you can actually you can look at that in terms of. Uh, um, Oh, crap. We almost skipped my epistasis. No, I don't want to do that. That would be terrible. Um, let's see, close. So, um, just thinking, uh, Alyssa, what's your um, blood type? And what's your, if you want to share, your O. So, um, you must be homozygous recessive for the O allele. So you have two copies of the O allele. And um, so if your son is also O, it means he got one allele, O allele from you and one from your, your husband. So your husband must be uh, a heterozygote with an O allele. And so he must be going by genetics, I can't, you know, I'm not saying must, uh, he almost certainly, if he has, if he's B, he's going to be heterozygous, going to be B, B heterozygous. So he'll be uh, B O. And so uh, if you were to have a, or you have, or you were to have another uh, child, then um it's a 50-50 probability whether that child would be either B or O. Yeah, if you're if you're both homozygous recessive, you can only have a homozygous recessive offspring. But you can have you can have two uh, B or two A individuals uh, produce an O offspring if both of those individuals are heterozygous. It kind of comes back to that uh, classical Mendelian inheritance, right? And so actually it's kind of fun because you can work out what your genotype is based on, you know, uh, what one or more of your parents are, which is kind of fun because I'm B positive. Um, B is the rhesus factor. But um, so I actually I need to ask my, my dad uh, what he is. Um, uh, maybe he knew what my mum was, uh, and then I could figure out what my genotype is. Actually, I need—I want to find out what my. Damn it! I don't know what kids are now. I need to find that out too. Anyway, so uh, before we uh, go too far off uh, on that tangent, um, let's get back to this and talk about epistasis. So epistasis is. Uh, essentially, it's kind of like dominance, but between genes, right? So it is, it's not really the breakdown of the law, law of independent assortment because alleles still assort independently, right? The thing that breaks that is linkage. Um, but in epistasis, you can have the f genotype of one gene dominate over the genotype of another gene. All right, so essentially, if you have uh, two genes, depending on the genotype of one of those uh, genes or loci, uh, will determine your phenotype, even if independent of the, the genotype at the other locus, right? And so that's called epistasis. Uh, give me a second.
and quite commonly this is uh, involves when you have multiple genes in the same pathway so for example if you want to produce a particular amino acid then there's going to be multiple steps in that pathway to go from the original uh, uh, input right the substrate to the final product so if you have a uh, particular genotype at one locus that can mask the effect on the other one it's not always the case the if you look at white cats um, you'll see that you can have a different type of epistasis right so that's essentially there's dominant and recessive epistasis and we're going to look at an example of uh, recessive epistasis so in this case you have uh, a pathway a relatively simple one produce a pigment right and you have two genes which are involved in making that pigment right and they work in a linear fashion so essentially you need both of those working to be able to see the phenotype at the end the purple phenotype because that intermediate doesn't have a color then basically uh, if you don't go all the way through you're going to be white right in terms of uh, pigmentation or lack of pigmentation and so when you do a dihybrid cross with uh, this example of epistasis you can have in your f1s you can still have uh, the dominant phenotype which is purple right here we've got our parents are uh, opposite um, homozygotes so we have one parent which is homozygous dominant for C and homozygous recessive for P and the other parent which is the opposite and that's just to show that you know you don't necessarily see the the phenotype the dominant phenotype in the parents it doesn't actually matter which way around you do it in terms of the F2 it's just to, to illustrate that that point However, when you cross those F1 heterozygotes to each other, right? So they're expressing the dominant phenotype, which is purple. Now you get only two phenotypes, purple or not purple, right? And essentially, if you look at this uh, grid in detail, right? Kind of like really drill into it. What you'll see is that you have to have a dominant allele for each gene to be purple anywhere where you are homozygous recessive for either gene or both you'll be white so essentially you have nine sixteenths or nine out of sixteen of those uh, offspring will be purple right because that all of those are have at least one dominant allele typically you would see uh, two other phenotype combinations the two three sixteenths but because in this case, one or other of those genes is homozygous, now you don't see those phenotypes, right? They don't exist. Now they're going to be exactly the same as the homozygous uh, recessive, right? Which you can see kind of over here, right? So now instead of being a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, now it's 9 to 7, right? And that's actually another classical uh, trait of epistasis is that you'll deviate from the classic dihybrid 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio right and um, for uh, so this is again this is recessive homeostasis uh, recessive not homeostasis epistasis um, in dominant epistasis you get a 12 to 3 to 1 ratio instead right so now it kind of goes the other way instead of uh, that uh, one of those three sixteenths being part of the recessive now you have three different phen phenotype combinations but one of those is kind of uh, one of those three sixteenths is incorporated into the the dominant trait so anytime you see a deviation from that classic nine to three to three to one ratio there's a very good chance that it's because epistasis is occurring.
It could also be because linkage is occurring too, but um, that's, another, that's a question for another day. Does anybody have any questions about that? Epistasis is not a trivial topic either. But the key thing to remember is, do we get deviation from 9 to 3 to 3 to 1? If we do, epistasis is a possible cause. And it just depends on the relationship between those two genes as to what that new ratio would look like, whether it's a 9 to 7 or a 12 to 3 to 1. Either one of those, however, is different from what one would expect. Okay, so what do we have left? I'm going to just kind of keep my eye on, on time. Essentially, we have uh, something called complementation, right, which is uh, pretty cool to think about, um, particularly in terms of uh, hybrids. Uh, we also have uh, sex-dependent expression, right, which is not the same as uh, sex linkage or sex-linked inheritance or sex determination. That's something uh, a little bit different, which is really cool. And we also have uh, two new terms, variable penetrance and variable or incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity, right? And that's really kind of expanding on uh, essentially the complexities of non-Mendelian inheritance, like the actual inheritance that we actually do see. And the classic one uh, kind of scenario where you'll see that is uh, human disease. So it's a really interesting one to, to study. And uh, mitochondrial disease is a really good example of that, uh, which if we get time, I'll go into in a little bit. Yeah, just have a quick drink before we start. All right. Make sure I have everything all ready together. Ah, okay. All right, where am I at? Okay, so complementation is a—it's almost more of a technique than anything else, right? It's a, more a way of uh, testing a hypothesis. And so essentially, uh, the deal behind complementation is if you have uh, two different mutations, right, which produce a certain phenotype, pardon me, do those two mutations occur in the same gene? And the way to test that is by complementation. So as you see here, um, we have uh, two different alleles, A and B, and we have uh, two uh, mutant individuals crossed together, right? So if that, those, mu those alleles, those mutant alleles are in the same uh, gene, we'll get a mutant offspring, right? So even though that individual will be heterozygous, pardon me, at that gene or at that locus, uh, which is called compound heterozy heterozygosity, because both of those alleles are non-functioning or mutant, we'll get the mutant phenotype, right? So this is a little bit kind of more advanced genetics, right? We're not talking about homozygous recessive equals mutant. We're talking about heterozygous equals mutant, but they're both recessive alleles, right? Which is a little bit of an expansion on what we've done before. And uh, look, so that's no, no complementation is occurring essentially. But if you cross those two individuals together, and you get a wild type phenotype, what that tells you is that those two alleles are in different genes, right? So uh, essentially what happens there is we've got a wild type, which is shown by plus uh, over here, and a recessive allele on two different genes, but then we have the opposite in our other uh, mutant individual. 
And so essentially what you get when you cross those two together is uh, an individual that's heterozygous at both loci. And if that's the case, you'll see the wild type phenotype because it follows the same pattern of uh, dominance. And so a real cool um, example of this is uh, axolotls, right? Uh, which ask a lot of questions. And um, essentially axolotls are, um, they're neo, uh, yeah, it's pedomorphosis, which basically means they stay as juveniles uh, into adulthood. And uh, juveniles have these kind of frilly external gills. They have uh, this big kind of fin-like tail. And uh, they still reproduce, even though they look like juveniles. But you can also have uh, normal uh, salamanders, which don't display that... Uh, kind of phenotype essentially. So what happens when you cross two different axolotls together? I'm not entirely sure how this works, right? Because they're different species, um, but clearly it does. So if you cross these two together, now you have a uh, normal hybrid. So I'm not sure whether this would be fertile, most likely not, um, but it doesn't have the um, pedomorphic um, trait or phenotype rather it looks like an adult and so what that tells us is that in these two different species the process that leads to that phenotype that um, juvenile phenotype is different in each of those because when we cross them together we don't see that phenotype and that's called complementation okay any questions All right. So next up, and again, this is a little bit of a laundry list. There's just a whole bunch of stuff to go through, but um, we're we're getting there. Not too much longer. Ever so quickly, um, we've got sex influence traits, and so the the easiest way to um, kind of look at this one is actually the uh, cock feathering in chickens, and so essentially. Uh, if you're a female chicken, it doesn't matter what your genotype is for this particular uh, locus. You're going to be hen feathered, right? Uh, which is like that, basically, you know, normal standard chicken. However, when, and this is a, a autosomal gene, right? So this isn't on the sex chromosome. This isn't sex linked inheritance. This is sex based expression, essentially. Um, if you're a, a male chicken, now you have a difference depending on genotype. If you're homozygous recessive, you're now cock feathered, right? If you have a dominant allele, you're not, you're still hen feathered. So essentially now we have a trait which is expressed differently in males to females because one of those genotypes equals a different phenotype in males and it doesn't in females. Okay, I think I'm zoomed in a little bit here. There we go. So, uh, moving on to expressivity and penetrance. So, penetrance is basically how how many individuals express the phenotype that you would expect. So, typically, in a normal uh, trait all of the individuals that are homozygous recessive for a disease would express that phen disease phenotype. However, there are some exceptions to that where uh, essentially other things kind of modify that uh, genotype. Again, it's kind of like a polygenic trait essentially. And so there are cases where you would not see an individual that has that phenotype, even though they have the disease genotype, the homozygous recessive genotype. So if you have some of those, essentially your penetrance is less than 100, and so it's incomplete penetrance. Right. So again, penetrance is essentially how, how far into a population of individuals with that genotype does this phenotype penetrate. And if it's not 
all of them, then it's incomplete. The flip side of that is, say you uh, have a particular disease causing uh, genotype and you have the disease, but your disease is less severe or more severe than another individual with that same genotype, right? This is called variable expressivity, right? So the, the degree to which that phenotype is expressed is different from one individual to the next, even though they have the same genotype. And so one example we can use is uh, polydactyly, right? There are actually quite a few examples of this. Um, and uh, polydactyly is a really, really interesting thing. It's actually, let's see if uh, I can bring up some examples. Just wait. Polydactyly. All right, give me just a, just a second. Do, do, do. Come on. Okay, uh, actually, got to go back to that. Mm -mm -mm. Are you ready? Ta da! Look at that! Isn't that awesome? I could spend all day looking at polydactyl kittens. There's that one. There's that one. This one's one of my favorite. I could go on and on and on. There's just so many. And so <laughs> they're actually extraordinarily good hunters because they have enormous paws. Here's another cute one. Isn't that adorable? It sure is, they're just giant paws. Anyway, that's actually not very super important. But uh, as an example, it's kind of neat because uh, essentially you can have individuals that have the, the uh, a dominant allele which would normally cause polydactyly, <laughs> um, but they are not polydactyl, right? So they have a normal number of uh, fingers or toes. And typically what it is, is uh, this is kind of one of my favorite dev bio examples. There's a signal which when you don't actually have fingers as an embryo, but you have a uh, like a disc, right? Which will become uh, your hand. There's a signal down here near your pinky on this side which is pro uh, little fingers essentially and that's restricted from this side and so essentially you have a thumb because you don't have any little finger signal and you have this finger because you have very little finger signal and so on and so forth until you get over to this side and so if you express that signal over here essentially now you get let's see if i can do this now you get that Right, so you get extra digits, and they're typically the um, the smaller digits. Sometimes you get it over here too, right? Uh, like something like that, for example. It just depends on what what allele and what what's being messed up. Um, so you can be have a dominant allele for polydactyly and not have uh, extra digits, and you can also have uh, the same allele, but instead of having one extra digit, you have two or three, right? It just depends. And so those are good examples of those incomplete penetrants, whether or not you have it, even if you have the gene type for it, and expressivity and kind of how much you have that. Okay, so what I want to do now is finish up uh, the rest of this and really, we're going to be talking about complex inheritance. And so complex inheritance is really basically more than one gene and gene by environment interactions. Right? Those are the, the two things uh, that influence that. So 
Uh, height is a classic example of complex inheritance. Uh, it's both polygenic, so there are multiple genes involved in how tall you are, uh, which is how you can go, like my parents were both relatively short. Both my brother and I are, are pretty tall, right? We're both over six foot tall. Um, it's also if we lined every one of you up in a room and kind of sorted you by height, you'd get a fairly continuous kind of, or maybe slightly lumpy uh, curve, right? So you have a lot of different um, kind of intermediates essentially, right? So that's a sign of a polygenic trait where you can have, uh, typically you would see what would be uh, this kind of curve, right? You'd see a normal bell curve um, in that population. And the, the more individuals you look at, the better fit that bell curve would be. And also as well, height is a great example because uh, there's a gene by environment interaction there too. So if you go to uh, like rural India or um, you know poor parts of Africa, you'll tend to find that the average height is quite a lot shorter than what you would expect um, elsewhere in the world, right? And that's not necessarily based on the genetic background of the people that live in that part of the world. It's because they don't eat enough, right? Because their diet their diet is restricted so there you're going to have a shift basically the tail towards the short end of that curve because uh the kind of genetic potential let's say uh for want of a better word isn't fully realized right so now you have a gene by environment interaction where if you took that individual and let's say rather than growing up in uh you know, Uttar Pradesh, for example, in northern India, you took that individual and you stuck him in a wealthy family in Germany, right? That individual will be much taller than they would be in India, not because their genes have changed or their expression of their genes have changed, but their environment has, right? So um, those two uh, are often interact, right, in complex ways. And so just as a, another example, because it's kind of a neat one to think about, you can also get, uh, and this is often thought of more in like terms of plants. No, they would be taller in Germany than they would be in India. Because uh, essentially, if you're malnourished, you can't grow as tall. Even if you have all the right genes to be like a, Oh, I'm sorry, um, befuddled uh, example. Yeah, so if you took an individual from or a child from uh, rural India, they most likely in India would attain a certain height, let's say five foot two, five foot three, something like that. If you took that same child and instead they grew up in a, a wealthier background or in a, a Western country where calories were not restricted, that child could grow up to be five foot six, five foot eight, even though the genes or the alleles or the genotype is exactly the same. And the reason for that is because of the environment. So if you don't have sufficient nutrition, you're never going to grow as tall as you should do because other things are essentially going to be limited, right? And so it's not, uh, you're not seeing the full expression of the genotype. You're seeing a gene gene type by environment interaction. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. And obviously that is gonna vary a lot depending on the trait in, in question and the environment uh, environmental factors. So another way of thinking about gene by environment interactions, and this is more of a plant thing, Although you can have it for, you know, um, like animals uh, that you're growing for, for food, is that you can have uh, different optimizations, right? So depending on your collection of alleles for different ge genes, different traits, you can vary you, how you uh, 
respond to that environment can vary, right? So this is a great example of that. So for here, example, uh, strain A or um, variety A of maize could be considered quite robust, right? So, um, you know, if you wanted to grow this version of maize in, you know, a country where there's not a lot of uh, fertilizer used or perhaps an environment which is kind of marginal for maize, I don't know what that would be, you know, a hillside perhaps or somewhere dry, um, this maize plant will survive quite well even if conditions are poor. But it doesn't, it's not going to do very well when conditions are good, right? So this could be considered a very robust uh, strain where, you know, you're not going to uh, shoot the lights out in terms of yield, but also if the uh, rains don't arrive quickly enough or the soil is a little bit poorer than it should be, you're not going to get terrible yields either, right? So compare that with uh, variety B. Now, if you're in a kind of like an industrial farm and you use like tons of fertilizer, you can control water, uh, you know, you're always going to get good sunlight, let's say Nebraska, right? Um, now, you're going to get far, far higher yield from strain B. But if you put that same strain in that poorer quality environment, your yield would plummet far more than the other strain. So essentially how those genotypes and the environment uh, interact can vary, right? So it's a lot more complex uh, than just having a certain strain going into a certain place, right? You can have degrees of robustness between different varieties of plants, um, you know, depending on what the environment is. Great example, out in our garden, uh, trying to grow strawberries right, which is not trivial in San Antonio because it gets bloody hot. Uh, and strawberries are like, you know, the cockroaches of the plant world. It's really, really hard to kill them. Um, and I've actually had them frozen in blocks of ice in the ground or in like raised beds and they're still perfectly happy. Uh, but here I had to get a special variety of uh, strawberries, which is much more heat tolerant, right? And now it doesn't... Uh, produce as much fruit as the more uh, common uh, variety, but it will survive better when it gets really hot. Not totally survive, because I'm not doing very well. I don't have many plants left, but it's still alive, uh, kind of, right? So that's another example of a gene by environment or genotype by environment interaction, right? And that uh, strain would still do just fine in cold conditions, but it just doesn't yield as much. So it's kind of more robust, I guess. Um, but it's not what you would see being grown in like a large strawberry farm uh, further north where it's not quite so hot in summer. Anyway, just as an example from my own garden. Okay, that's pretty much what I've got for today in terms of lecture material. Um, cat in a window. Does anybody have any questions about any of that stuff? Should check it out, see if there are any birds outside. Gabrielle, far away. Okay, I just wanted to kind of recap on one of the subjects was, um, I don't even think I'm saying right, complementation. Uh, yep. Um, so we're saying that if it occurs in the same gene, then that would mean that the individual would be mutated? It would express the mutant phenotype. Okay, and then if they're on opposite, that means they're complement yes. to each other? They're on different genes. So essentially what this is, is about trying to figure out whether, so let's say you did a, I don't know, a mutant screen, right? You uh, mutagenize a whole bunch of individuals and you got different individuals which are expressing the same mutant phenotype, let's say uh, white eyes, right? And you wanted to figure out, okay, are all of these different mutations that I've caused, are they all in the same gene? Or can this phenotype be caused by multiple uh, mutations in multiple different genes, 
right? So that's kind of the, the setup here. And so essentially, if you crossed all of those individuals with each other and all you ever got were white-eyed offspring expressing the mutant phenotype, then that tells you all of those different mutations that you've got are in the same gene. Does that make sense? Okay, I can see that. Right. Because it doesn't matter whether you've got, you know, uh, animal, you know, 20 crossed with animal 25. They're both white eyes, but you still get white eyed offspring. And you keep doing that with all the others and all you ever get are white eyed offspring. That's telling you all the mutations you're getting all occur in the same gene. Now, if you had those two different individuals from your mutant screen and you cross them together and now you got red eyes, like a wild type phenotype, what that tells you is that those two different mutations are in different genes. Because now you get, now they're going to be heterozygous for both genes both of the genes. And so you're going to see the dominant phenotype because they're heterozygous and you and that dominant phenotype is the wild type phenotype. So essentially, uh, complementation means you're, you're, uh, making up for a mutation in a particular gene with a wild type allele from another gene from, from another individual. So you're complementing it. So if you've got a mutation in A at the bottom of this uh, slide, you can uh, cover that up or complement it or rescue it is sometimes what they're called with a wild type copy of that gene from the other individual, the one that's A plus and vice versa. So in the... Does that mean go on. that the uh, mutation gene is not expressed? It means that you've got two different genes and you don't express the phenotype from either of them because okay. both of those genes essentially get each get a, a wild type allele from the other one. So if this one is a wild type for B and this is wild type for A, when you cross them together, you're going to have one wild type A and one wild type B allele from each. So even if they are uh, homozygous recessive for the other gene, you'll end up producing offspring that are heterozygous. Does that help? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Or, or think about it in another way. Each chromosome is going to have at least one wild type allele, but they're going to be in different genes. And so essentially, if we talk about linkage, these are translinked. They are kind of the opposite. We'll get to that on Thursday. Or you're covering up the mutant phenotypes of both genes by wild type alleles from the other individual. Basically. So yeah, it's really about think, thinking about is it one, one gene or two genes? Because you can have multiple alleles in the same gene that will produce the same phenotype. Like cystic fibrosis, for example, I think there are like 1,500 disease-causing alleles. Right? And so if, you, if two individuals that are homozygous recessive for uh, different cystic fibrosis alleles uh, had a, a child, that child would have cystic fibrosis. Even though the alleles are different, they're still in the same gene. So hopefully that helps. Cool. Does anybody else have any questions? No. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, cool. Okay. So 10 past one. Uh, I need to have some lunch for a pass out. Uh, so let's get back together at 1.40. Uh, for the for the lab. And uh, yeah, then we'll go through that. Also, any questions you might have for...
uh, the lab that's due tonight or that accident about me putting the due date yesterday, which is hopefully all fixed. Um, anyway, so see you in half an hour, 1.40. All right, ta-ta for now.